Um, that means that plastic helps toxic material enter the food chain. And there are plenty of articles now showing that plastic is showing up in our food. Here's one from about, about two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. Um, microplastics found in mussels that, eat, that humans eat. So um, we are finding plastic throughout the food chain with the potential to be carrying with them toxins that then go up the food chain as well. So what's happening in the oceans does come back to us in one way or another. All right, so um, just to give you kind of some background on, on why this is important as kind of a global uh, problem, but now we'll kind of focus back on uh, our local area and uh, talk about uh, what the plastic looks like in Lake Michigan. Again, this is a, where I first started my, um, my research. And so I'll um, tell you a little bit about it. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the methods, but I'll uh, try to just show you some of the results of what we found. Um, I, uh, well, having missed the year of COVID, I can't even, can't even count years anymore. So it was like three years ago, maybe, we were doing research with, uh, with a couple of students on um, both plastic litter, the large scale litter and microplastics. Mac microplastics are any fragments of plastic that are five millimeters or smaller. So you can see microplastic according to the definition is five millimeters, um, but it goes down to microscopic scale plastic as well. So I was interested in what's the distribution of microplastic and plastic on Lake Michigan beaches. And I was curious to know are public beaches that have a lot of access, a lot of use, are they more polluted than say nature preserves, which don't have much uh, visitation? And so I picked four sites along Lake Michigan. One was uh, Makatawa Park, uh, which is a kind of a private housing um, area, but it does have a beach that gets extensive use. And then there's a Castle Park Preserve a little bit south of there that is a nature preserve uh, associated with Ca Castle Park, but um, the beach is, is very isolated, so it's actually really hard to get to. Um, and then uh, down in Saugatuck, there's Oval Beach, which is very popular, uh, lots and lots of visitors there. And just north of that, the Saugatuck Harbor Natural Area, which sees much less visitation. So I'll quickly show you uh, some of the uh, these beaches, I'm not, again, going to spend a whole lot of time on what methods uh, I used. Well, basically, what we did was we uh, put tape measures down and collected plastic within one meter of, you know, these seven different lines, um, and then counted up the plastic numbers of pieces of plastic, numbers of pieces of microplastic that we were found. Um, for the microplastic, we simply sampled sand, took random samples of the sand, and, and looked um, for microplastic in um, in like quart jar size samples. Um, Makatawa Park is again, a, it's a private beach, somewhat low visitation, but there are people living there. Um, and it is a groomed beach. So there are people that come out and pick up the trash or the litter that's, that's on the beach. Um, it's uh, kind of very narrow uh, in the Southern part, it winds out in the Northern part. And there is a, a small rack line. And what I mean by that is that's where uh, vegetation washes up on the beach. So that this is the rack line here. So this is just a picture of Castle Park showing the wide beach and a little bit of the narrow beach. And we sampled kind of various places uh, on the beach here. I'm not gonna go into the details of, of that too much. Um, we did look and see, is there microplastic up on the shore? Is it down on the, the beach face itself and the lower beach? You know, where's the plastic and microplastic accumulating? The nature preserve is a much narrower beach and uh, again, low visitation, it's not groomed. So there was nobody uh, cleaning up the, the material. And so there's a lot of rack here, a lot of plant debris on this beach, but a fairly narrow beach. Moving further south to the Saugatuck Harbor natural area, this also is a fairly narrow beach, again, not groomed and um, a lot of rack. And so here you can see as well, um, so, um, and that's very different from the beach just south of that, which is Oval Beach, where we sampled right along here, uh, where it was just sand. There was really no rack line at all. This is what it looks like. So that was our, our sampling. 
I'm gonna put up these tables and you don't have to worry about the numbers too much. I'll, I'll highlight what's important. Basically looking at litter, what we found, we're counting pieces per square meter of litter. Uh, at the rack line was where we found almost all the litter. So places where the vegetation is, that's where the litter is. So up to 175 pieces of litter per, per square meter. If we look at microplastic, um, we have almost the same story that's predominantly in the rack line. There's one spot where the litter was, the microplastic was more abundant elsewhere, but most of it was, was concentrated at the rack line, very little elsewhere in the places we sampled. Uh, looking at Sagatuck, Har Sagatuck Harbor Natural Area, it's the same story again. Up to 325 pieces of litter in the rack line, maybe two on the lower beach, maybe two on the upper beach. So the litter is concentrated in that uh, area of vegetation, trash. And a microplastic, same story again. Um, so if we look at kind of in general, the litters, the, the top uh, diagram here, uh, all the high numbers, all the high uh, counts of litter are at the rack line. Um, that microplastic, we weren't able to, to uh, process the Castle Park samples, but it's again the same story. Uh, lots of microplastic at the rack line. All right, so what's going on here? Uh, I guess one, one other thing I will say, which this is one of the surprising findings of this uh, initial research, is remember our, our nature preserves are Castle Park and Saugatuck Harbor, and those numbers are higher than the um, litter numbers that we're finding at the groomed beaches. So the places, the public beach, where there's lots of visitors, um, has less litter than the, um, than the nature preserves. And the same is true for microplastic. Um, there's much more microplastic in the nature preserves than there is on the groomed beaches. All right, so the, the litter is associated with this rack or with this vegetation. So why might that be? Well, the veget one thing the rack line is, is the place where stuff washes up on the shore and it sits there, right? It's able to stay there. So maybe the plastic is just coming along for the ride and sitting there as well. And so it may just be an indicating where material gets deposited on the beach. So that's, that's one possibility. The other possibility though, is that this litter may actually be helping trap the plastic. So the plastic washes up in a wave, the filters down in, um, and it gets kind of trapped, caught up in the, in the vegetation. And then, you know, sand blowing along the beach can get caught and kind of bury it in place. And so the rack may be um, helping to baffle that microplastic. Um, so this, this, again, was kind of a counterintuitive finding. Uh, the idea that if you let the litter accumulate, it's going to, to pick up plastic. That does maybe tell us one potential way that we could try to solve the plastic problem is to basically set out traps or material that will trap plastic. So as waves come in and wash pieces of plastic onto the beach, they get trapped in, you know, um, some sort of material, maybe you put it like a, a shag rug sort of thing, you know, uh, fuzzy carpet, and you trap the material and then you can clean the plastic out. That's, that's you know, something to, to explore as a potential, um, potential way to use this finding to try to solve the, the microplastic problem. That's not a direction I'm, go I'm going right now, but it's, it's one of the suggestions from, from this work. Um, let's see, a couple of other things. We tried to identify what kind of plastic or what kind of litter is washing up on the beaches. It was very difficult to come up with firm identifications for things. Uh, we can find styrofoam is easy to recognize. So we have a little styrofoam. Uh, pellets are um, industrial plastic pellets, uh, sometimes called nurdles. And so those are um, what's, they're, they're kind of the raw form that plastic comes in when it goes to a factory that's going to do injection molding and make car parts and things like that. And they're just little, they look kind of like the size of a BB or so, just little plastic round, round or ovalish pellets. And those are fairly common. Um, it's interesting, I don't know of too many plastic fabrication uh, plants or companies right here in the Holland area. So this may be an indication of the, the, the predominance of pellets, the abundance of pellets, may be an indication of how much plastic has come from elsewhere um, into the, uh, the shoreline. 
And it's very hard to come up with identifiable fragments. Sometimes it's like, you know, the cap of a pen or a bottle cap or things like that you might be able to identify. But, it's, um, but the beach plastic is oftentimes in unidentifiable fragments. That's what um, much of the, the plastic material was. So uh, another thing to notice is that the most abundant kind of plastic varies between our sites. So one nature preserve has a lot of styrofoam, another has more fragments. So um, the uh, occurrence of litter is kind of a local thing. It's, you can't necessarily measure one or two places on the shoreline and say, you know, this is what Lake Michigan litter looks like. It's pretty local as to what accumulates where. Uh, microplastics, kind of the same story. The dominant type of microplastic also varied between sites. And um, even within a single site, like at Saugatuck Harbor, fragments were the most common kind of litter, but styrofoam was the most common kind of microplastic. So uh, what's sitting at the site may not be sitting there and breaking down in place to produce smaller fragments. Um, so you know, the, the microplastic isn't always tracking what's going on with the, the larger scale litter. And then one final thing, this is kind of an important one, I think, for understanding what's going on with uh, plastic uh, in our area, is that um, more than 97% of what we collected was uh, plastic that could float. There are um, different densities of plastic. Some plastic is uh, dense enough that it will sink in water, but 97% uh, of what we collected was uh, material that would float. And that suggests it may well have floated to get to, um, to the, the beach where it was deposited. Okay, so that's a very quick run through of uh, a summer's worth of research about what's going on at the beach. Uh, I wanna switch now and talk about um, this past summer's work at uh, trying to characterize litter along our roadsides. Um, Again, recognizing that, that the stuff on the beach probably didn't start off getting put there as fragments, it was starting as something else. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, just kind of give you the, the gist of what we were, did this past summer. We sampled uh, four different areas um, and we counted the uh, north side of the road and the south side of the road as two different sampling sites. Um, the main places we sampled were on Lakewood Avenue at near Stuvisser Trails. Um, and again, Lakewood Avenue um, over um, just, just east of the Kentucky Fried Chicken area. So, uh, part of the reason I picked these two sites is that they have a sidewalk on one side of the road, but not the other. And so it was a sense of, you know, if there are pedestrians producing litter, maybe it stays on one side versus auto traffic, maybe providing more litter to the other side. Um, these are also spots where the, um, the road is crossing a stream. And so there's potential to have what we find as litter, having a pathway to get into the lake eventually. So this is a potential for um, being able to track how the, how the litter is moving. We also uh, looked at Pine Avenue, a spot kind of in a residential area and another residential area on, on Fairbanks Avenue. Um, just to give you a sense of what things look like, this is the Lakewood Avenue near Stu Visser, a little piece of plastic um, sitting there. Um, so it's roadside plastic, there it is. And um, here's the uh, kind of wetland that flows into the stream that goes under the, um, under the road. Contrast that with the Fairbanks site, where um, much more residential. And we did find differences in the amounts of litter between the sites. Um, we collected the litter and brought it back to the lab and then classified it. Uh, we uh, also took each piece and put it in water to see if it floats or sinks and uh, just get a sense of what the density is. And, um, and uh, categorized it to understand or to know what um, material it's made of. Is it metal, wood, plastic, um, et cetera? The most common thing we found were cigarette butts. It's the number one single item. Um, we collected more than 4,000 cigarette butts. <laughs> yeah. um, 
there's fume hoods in the lab. It's kind of nice to have a little bit of <laughs> fresh air circulating. All right, so here's the results. Um, the first three columns here, the, the first is just plastic of all different sorts. This would be, you know, pop bottles. This would be, you know, bottle caps, uh, um, cigar tips, um, you know, uh, chip bags, etc., uh, and unidentifiable plastic fragments. So those are all there. Cigarette butts are made of cellulose, which is a form of plastic. It does degrade uh, for about a five-year span, um, which um, I think. If, if you think about it, seeing the, the amount of cigarette butts that we collected, if, the, if those butts weren't degrading, we'd be kind of wading through them hip deep you know, at this point. <laughs> um, so um, that's a, that is a form of plastic. It is one that's maybe less of a concern long-term because it does break down. The issue with cigarette butts, however, is that um, the, the, the purpose of a, a cigarette filter is to filter the smoke that's coming through. So they do collect tars and all kinds of other toxic materials that then get just tossed out into the environment. And as the cigarette um, cellulose breaks down, those other chemicals are still left or released into the environment. So they are a concern. Um, they're not a concern um, in terms of like the long-term ocean plastic concern, but they, they have their own kind of toxicity concerns. And then styrofoam um, was another, uh, about 7% of what we collected was styrofoam, so a specific type of plastic. So overall, um, then paper was next abundant, metal and glass were uh, much less common, uh, which is a little strange. Glass is the most durable of the materials that, you know, of these that we've collected, and it's the least common to be found in roadside litter. Um, similar to what we found on the, with looking at the beach samples, the plastic or the litter uh, varies from place to place. So um, this is uh, just showing four of our, our uh, sampling days results. Um, so Stu Visser, north side of the road, plastic was half of what we found. Cigarette butts was about a quarter. It's the same on the south side of the road for the cigarette butts here, but the south side of the road had much more styrofoam and only about half as much plastic. So, um, you know, variability just on which side of the road you're collecting. Over at Lakewood, this was our uh, treasure trove of cigarette butts. This happened to be along the north side of Lakewood is the side that has the sidewalk. And um, it's actually not too far from a trailer park, which um, I hadn't realized when I was first you know, setting up the site, but, you know, there's a huge number of houses that all come out to the same main road and then walk to, to you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken or elsewhere. So um, a more pedestrian traffic than I thought you know, when I first picked the site, um, at least more potential for that. And that maybe shows up in the cigarette butts. Um, many fewer on the south side of the road where there is no sidewalk. So a lot of variability again over a short distance, which is I think an important lesson if we're trying to figure out and do sampling to figure out what's the litter like. Well, it's pretty variable. All right, so what can we say to summarize what we found with the litter? Well, 88% of the litter that starts off on the roadside is able to float. It's less dense than, than water, and so it can float. So what that suggests is that we have a large supply of stuff that if it gets into a stream has the ability to be transported to the lake easily. So, so you know, the litter is, um, um, is predisposed to be mobile if it gets into a stream. Um, and 83% of that litter is plastic. Um, and, you know, a bunch of that cigarette butts, but um, so 35% of this will biodegrade uh, within a decade or so, but the rest of it is gonna be around for much longer. As I already mentioned, litter varies from site to site. And one final thing we noted was that the single sources of litter can be significant. Um, some of the plastic on the south side of Lakewood was uh, Pontiac uh, Grand Am that was, uh, we had the whole front end, we had pieces of HUD caps, we had, you know, so a single car crash produced tremendous amount of, of material. Um, likewise, we could recognize when a box full of packing peanuts had been dumped or exploded because we find the same kind of packing peanuts scattered all along the way. So, so single releases of litter can be significant. 
Um, so thinking again about, all right, how does the litter get there? You know, what are the sources of the litter? We kind of, you know, the first part was characterizing what's the litter like, and then we can start thinking about, you know, why is it showing up along the roadside? Well, we, I think one of the things I've um, come to the conclusion is that some litter is purposeful. Um, this is kind of, this was the alcoholic collection at the, um, at the, uh, um, Stuvisser north side of the road. Um, what was striking about this was all of these E and J bottles right here. This is E and J brandy. All these were found within maybe a hundred meters. They're, some are fresh, some are older, some have been sitting in the water for it looks like a long period of time, but they're all within the same hundred meters. So this is somebody who's visiting a friend's house, maybe pulling out and tossing their bottle out before they head home um, and doing that repeatedly over and over again. So you know, one person is potentially responsible for all of this. Um, we have a whole bunch of fireball bottles here too. It's probably not the same story. Um, what we, one of the things we found is that uh, fireball is the drink of choice of people who litter. <laughs> so if, if, if you've, you know, um, the fireball uh, bottles are everywhere. <laughs> so it's just, um, you know, so I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's half of what's sold at liquor stores. I, I'm not sure, but, but they, they show up kind of um, in abundance, um, but, but not in one spot like this, like the E&J um, bottles were. Um, another kind of litter might be something I would call as maybe inattentive littering. Um, it's not necessarily purposeful. I mean, I can imagine again with the alcohol, especially, you know, why would you want to not have alcohol in your um, car? Well, maybe you're worried about getting pulled over or maybe you're underage and you're going to go home without the bottle in the, in the car for your parents to find. You know, there's lots of reasons why you might purposefully litter. Um, and then there is just kind of, you might call this, in a, in a, I consider it inattentive littering um, where you have things like, um, but, but by the way, this is a collection of litter I collected yesterday while walking my dogs. Um, so this is just, you know, my dogs are small, so we didn't go all that far. So maybe, you know, six or eight blocks. Um, but there are things like there's a Jolly, Jolly Rancher candy wrapper here. I can imagine somebody opening the Jolly Rancher and not even thinking about it and dropping it or putting it in their pocket and not having it get all the way into the pocket and blowing out. Um, this right here is the top of a um, cigar package. It might be this one right here. I didn't match them up to, to find out, but you can imagine ripping open a packet and you lose the little stub that you ripped off and it just kind of goes to the ground. So some of that is kind of incidental littering. It's not purposeful. It's not being very careful though. Um, so that, that may be some of the, um, some of the cause of litter. And then, as I already mentioned, another, uh, another source of litter is accidental releases. Uh, this could be an actual traffic accident, as with our front end of our Pontiac Grand Am here. Um, or other accidental releases could be material blowing out of a vehicle. I've witnessed this, you know, traveling behind a garbage truck. There goes, you know, a piece of you know, garbage um, that, that happens. Um, you know, you, you may have seen just, um, you know, I've lost materials out of my own car as well. And then yet another accidental release would be uh, litter containers. Um, and I have to say, I've actually had this happen twice where my recycling bin has fallen down um, and it's a windy day and stuff is scattered all over the place. Um, as just one example of this, one of the things I found here, this little crumpled thing here, turns out as a postcard to my daughter <laughs> that um, my recycling bin fell down last week during the long, you know, strong winds. And um, I found this postcard in the neighbor's yard, you know, yesterday. So, um, so there is, um, so there is lots of ways in which we accidentally release litter to the environment. Okay. Um, So one of the questions that I've asked this past summer as well was what happens to the roadside litter after it's deposited? So what are some of the things that could happen to litter? 
I'm, I'm sorry? Ingestion. Ingestion. So organisms could ingest it. Um, my dog tends to like to chew on things that have some food on it. So that's, a, that's certainly a possibility. Another thing I found is squirrels will pull litter out of a trash can if somebody's throwing away a um, sauce cup or something. You know, the squirrels will pull it out. You can see that they've chewed the edges of the, the plastic there. So, so that's certainly something that does happen to, to litter. Um, litter along the side of a road, what, what do you think might happen to it? It could blow around. All right, so it could certainly blow around. Um, yes, lawn mowing. And then there's one other thing that I can think of roadside litter. It does get picked up, yes. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it's picked up and used, uh, yeah, uh, fibers and fragments in birds' nests, certainly. Um, the one that I'm thinking about, it's on the side of a road, it can be hit by a car, right? So, um, in order to look and, you know, this is partly tracing, we, we see what this litter looks like now. Uh, one of the things we looked at was kind of how much are whole items and how many are fragmentary items. But we wanted to know, you know, when it gets to the beach, it's all fragments. So what is happening in the meantime? So one of the things is it could be getting hit by cars and what happens to it then? Or the other thing would be mowing experiments. And one of the reasons I came up with this is I, I ran across this, that what, uh, it was more scattered than this. I kind of collected this little uh, accumulation of material. It was sitting on the, the lawn at Hope College where the grounds people had just run over in a little M&M's packet and scattered plastic all over. And so mowing is certainly a, a, a hazard. And so this is kind of helping tell the story of what happens from when the plastic starts off as uh, a fresh item of litter to how does it become those unidentifiable fragments on the shoreline. So uh, I told my students, go to the parking lot and run over stuff with your car. <laughs> um, and here are the results. So they can get up to about 25 miles an hour, 40 kilometers an hour. And um, they, they, put out, they, they put out all kinds of um, uh, original things, you know, uh, cans, bottles, uh, et cetera. And this is, um, some of the results of running over things in the car. The straws surprisingly didn't do much. They kind of would split along one side, but um, didn't do much. Uh, the plastic spoon and fork just kind of flexed and came back. It's really surprising. Um, some things did kind of shatter. It really depends on the kind of plastic. Uh, it turns out that the kind of plant-based plastic, the biodegradable plastic that you that they might get, um, that is pretty brittle. And so um, this is one of those cups and it was kind of shattering. Um, one of the other things that uh, is noticeable about this, you can kind of see it here, is that when you hit a cup, it tends to break into these kind of rectangular pieces or strips. And that's pretty characteristic. So when we look at roadside litter, we often find these kind of little rectangular sort of fingers. And so that suggests that we can tell a little bit about the history of the, the plastic as it's, um, um, you know, what's happened to it since it, you know, got deposited or first, first thrown out as a piece of litter. Um, the other set of experiments we did was mowing experiments. And so um, uh, for some reason, I don't have pictures of the cup experiment, um, but one of the things that we found was that when you mow over a plastic cup, you don't get those rectangular sort of strips. What you get is uh, kind of needle, double pointed shards or needles of plastic. And so um, that uh, helped us kind of see uh, some of what's going on. And mowing produces a tremendous number of fragments. So if you have plastic that sees a lawnmower before it gets blown into the ditch or into the creek, or whatever, um, that's, that's maybe producing your fragments to begin with. So that's one of the, one of the things we found. Um, and again, I don't really have good, uh, a, a nice cup example, but the, the uh, plastic cups in the lawnmower tend to break in these more pointy sort of elongated shards. And this is uh, showing just kind of how much materials fragment. Um, you know, styrofoam 
you know, goes from one piece or well, single cup to about 170 pieces. Um, you know, so you know, that's that's making microplastic kind of instantly. Um, Plastic straws also really shatter. It's, they're, they're startling in how, how badly they, some of them will shatter, um, you know, 70 pieces. So um, this is one of my final suggestions on what we do is don't mow litter. You know, pick up your litter before you mow. Okay, so that's kind of a summary of um, the what's going on on land and then starting to think about what happens to that trash you know on its journey or you know, before its journey to become part of you know what we find on the beach and so the piece that we're missing is that middle piece of how does it get from land to the shoreline you know um and so um this again i'm calling this speculating because this is what we'll be studying this summer we did do a little bit of examining of this question last summer though, because there are really two ways that you can go uh, from the roadside to, um, to the lake. One is to get into a stream, like we have this piece of styrofoam sitting here in the stream. So get into the stream, again, we found that 88% of that roadside litter is gonna float. So once it's in the stream, it's got a good chance of being transported. Um, the other way is to get into the storm drain. And if you're in a storm drain, that goes straight out to um, to in our area to Lake Nakatawa, and then from there to go right into Lake Michigan. Um, and we know that plastic does end up in the storm drains. This is you know, the water bottle. Here's a little plastic uh, filament and a, a plastic piece, maybe a car piece, some, some hard flat piece of plastic, all sitting here ready to get flushed into the storm drain. So one of the things we did last summer was we um, checked in with some of our uh, city of Holland uh, sanitation uh, or you know, uh, city workers um, who are using this vector truck to uh, clean out the storm drains. So the storm drain has this catch basin that's uh, here at the curbside. It's not very deep. It's maybe a foot deep or so. And then this is a five or six foot deep sump behind it. The catch basin flows into the sump. And then there's a pipe that's kind of high on the wall of the sump. So the sump's about four feet deep. Um, and that will catch sediment, rocks, and our question was, is it catching litter as well? Um, um, and so we uh, had them <laughs> jump down into the, the manhole and scoop up a bucket of, of uh, the sludge in the sump, and then we checked it for plastic and microplastic. We also cleaned out the, um, this material, um, the material that was in the catch basin to see what's coming from the street. This was on Pine Avenue. Uh, this was the litter from 300 meters of Pine Avenue. Pine Avenue was pretty clean. It's a residential area. Uh, it was a park on one side, but it's the, uh, not much in the way of litter really compared to some of the other places you went. Cigarette butts are fairly common. Uh, this is, looks like it's actually from a street sweeper, a piece of plastic brush from a street, sweep, street sweeper, and then just a few miscellaneous fragments of various kinds. So. Um, so that was pretty clean. What we found in the sump, um, you know, down here in the catch basin and in the sump was a total of 10 pieces of litter. And that seemed like not so much um, given that they were cleaning these, um, these um, catch basins out once a year. So after a whole year, it's caught 10 pieces of litter uh, when there's at least this much kind of sitting on the, the road and the sidewalk area available. Um, so our hypothesis is that if litter gets into the storm drain, most of it's gonna float and it's gonna just kind of float up and go right into the pipe that goes all straight out to Lake Mac. So once it's in the storm drain, it's kind of gone. This is, um, is my hypothesis. I can't demonstrate that. We've only really looked at one catch basin, but that's the, the, the initial idea uh, that we have so far is that we're not trapping uh, great amounts of litter in our, our current storm drain setup. It's catching things like gravel and things like that, maybe some heavier materials, but the, the, you know, the roadside litter is mostly gonna be floating away. What's a possible solution? Well, one thing that people have done is installed bags along storm drain um, outflows to catch what's there. 
Um, and this might be a possibility for our area. Uh, our area doesn't have these kind of um, larger channels so much. It's just a single pipe coming out and then you know flowing into, into Lake Mac typically. Um, so this would be a way to, to capture litter. There are some issues with this. Uh, some of these bags are pretty expensive. Um, and uh, I've, my wife tracked down a system in Australia, but the bag was about $18,000 to install. <laughs> so it was much bigger than, than this, but, um, but you know, it's, a, it's, it's an expense. Um, and somebody has to go around and maintain these and empty them, make sure that they're not clogged, et cetera. And if you have a really good flood, and this is kind of designed, if there's a really good flood, it's gonna bypass it, but that may be when you're moving a lot of litter anyway, is when you've got a good flood. And so it, it will work at kind of normal times or low flow, but it you know, may get bypassed at higher flow times. So, but this is, you know, this would be the kind of solution you might think about. We don't have any solution like this on our storm drain system now in the Holland area. Okay, um, the other aspect, the other way to get litter from the roadside into the lake is in a stream. And so that's what the next part of my research is going to be. Um, so we have on order one of these, it's called a trash trout. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't name it, but there you have it. <laughs> um, and so it floats in the stream. It's basically a, pon a cage with pontoons. Um, it'll float in the stream, and then you can connect these um, buoys to the um, stream, and that channels the um, trash into the cage, and it will collect litter of a certain size. It's not going to collect microplastic, but it will um, give us a, a sampling of what material is coming down the stream. And so um, our project this summer is to install this in several different places. Uh, in Holland to kind of get a, a sense of how much material is coming down the various streams. Is it worthwhile doing a litter collection uh, project long-term for some of our streams or not? Um, it's uncertain at this point. Um, one of the, but this will be telling us, you know, what material is in that pathway that's going to get out to the lake and, and become the, you know, the um, lake litter and eventually potentially marine litter. Um, so we'll be able to see kind of what, what material from the roadside is, is actually making that journey. Um, one of the uh, things I like about this project is I have a colleague uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania, who's going to be doing a very similar project. She, she's going to be sampling uh, material in some of their streams. And so we'll be able to compare. Um, one of the things this will let us do um, that I'm particularly interested in is I think I'm hoping we'll be able to see the effects of Michigan's returnable bottle law. Um, I'm, a, I'm betting that she's going to see many more soft drink and beer bottle sorts of things than what we're going to find in our, um, our trash trout. Um, and so that will be one indication of how well is the policy of, you know, having a 10 cent deposit, how well is that working to keep litter out of our uh, waterways. Um, so we'll be doing similar, uh, similar sort of project to what we did uh, for trash on land, looking at different you know, kinds of materials, what are the sources, what, you know, what items are there, what kind of containers are there. But one other piece that my colleague is particularly interested in looking at is doing a brand analysis also. So it's not just what bottle is it, but whose bottle is it? Um, is, you know, are there people that make me uh, saying you need to do more advertising for your end users to know how to best dispose of their materials? Or do you need to think about using some other, you know, um, solution besides plastic cup lids if, you know, if you're, they're going to show up in, in our sampling all the time, that sort of thing. Um, so we'll be doing this brand analysis to see if there are ways that we can um, talk about what's going on at the source of the plastic and um, either get um, help get help in changing consumer behaviors or changing the behavior of the producers who are you know coming up with that plastic in the first place. Okay, this is probably what you all really want to know, and that is, what can you do to help solve the plastic um, problem? 
And so the, the very first thing, and this is really the biggest thing, which is why I put it first, um, it's also the hardest thing, is reduce the plastic you use. Think about substitutes. Um, my way of thinking of this is think about what would be used 150 years ago. Um, plastic first became widespread in around the 1950s or so. That's when um, plastic really started to, to become um, dominant widespread, but people consumed materials, you know, they um, packaged food and that sort of thing before the 1950s, what did they use? Um, I will back up and preface this a little bit and say there are good reasons why we use plastic. Um, there's some environmental benefits to using plastic. For one, one thing, it's lightweight. If you have anything with transportation, it makes sense to you know, make it out of plastic instead of make it out of steel. So um, plastic milk crates you know, has you know, been a thing, whereas in the past they would have been made of you know, wooden crates or other materials. But it's heavier, you're transporting it all the time, you're gonna use less energy if it's a lightweight plastic. Um, so you know, again, there, and there are some ways in which our food is safer because we're using plastic. Less food poisoning, for example, than what you might get with um, you know, other, other kinds of food storage our food packaging. So, um, so, you know, there are certainly times when you want to, when it's beneficial to use plastic, but overall we should try it. If there is a good substitute, um, a viable substitute, opt for the viable substitute instead of the plastic in the first place. Um, something that I tell my students is pick up two pieces of plastic every day. Um, this may, it sounds kind of silly, but it gets you what it does is it makes you alert and aware of where is a plastic accumulating. And then you can start thinking about, well, is there something I can do to prevent that? Um, so uh, that really is, is, it's a way to promote your own awareness. Something that you can do, it sounds uh, difficult, but I've found this again, walking my dogs. I just, I take a plastic bag with me, it's plastic, you know, but, um, <laughs> but I dispose of it properly. <laughs> um, I take a bag with me and I pick up the plastic that I see. And what I found is that if, you know, I go different routes, different days and whatnot, but uh, you know, six or eight or 10 blocks around my house, I can keep that area fairly clean. If I don't go on that route for a couple of weeks, there'll be more plastic there, but I, you can clean the area, certainly your street, you can keep that clear. And that will keep any plastic from being able to go into a storm drain um, or if you have a stream crossing nearby, I'll keep it out of there. So you, you can do that with your street. It's just gotta be kind of a habit sort of thing. So it helps to have a dog to walk um, to, so that you're cruising around the neighborhood anyway. I've already mentioned, don't mow litter. Make it a point to pick up materials rather than just mow over it and assume it's gonna disappear. You may not see those fragments because they'll go into the grass, but they're still there and they, are, they can be mobile. Um, you know, whether that's a big, you know, big rainfall that causes material to float up and, and out into the, um, into the street, into the storm system, or, you know, um, just as you're mowing uh, the next time around, those pieces get caught up and scattered um, and blown around, you know, just don't mow litter and you'll be not making microplastic. Another one is secure your waste containers. Again, I've said I've, I've been guilty of this, having my recycling bin fall over and finding material blown all down the street. In fact, I one, one time had to blow over and get snowed on. I was finding pieces of shredded paper for the next six months. <laughs> I just got basically frozen into the, into the, the snow along the side of the road. Um, and then finally, uh, basically treat plastic as a hazardous waste. It is a hazardous waste. It's not immediately hazardous, but if you're gonna use plastic, be sure that you dispose of it. So that, um, you know, to the best of your ability, it's disposed of and it's not loose in the environment. Um, don't treat incidental releases of plastic as incidental, treat it as, oh, I've, I've torn the, you know, I've torn open my candy wrapper. I need to dispose of both pieces of you know, the, the, the big part of the wrapper and the little tab I've torn off. I need to just make sure that you dispose of any of that plastic um, so that it doesn't escape. All right.
those are my suggestions. And I'm hoping you have lots of questions for me. We can probably go ahead and turn on the lights now as well. Yes. Um, well, I get, yeah, there's a question here. Let's wait for the microphone, I guess. Right up here. Oh. I don't intend to monopolize the time, but I have a lot of questions. Let's start with the last. Um, can you talk a little bit about what is plastic and what is not? Is cellophane a plastic? Is there biodegradable uh, material that we can depend on as biodegra biodegradable? So cellophane is a plastic. Um, plastic is, the, the basic definition of plastic is it's a chain of carbon molecules hooked to, carbon molecules hooked to each other, or carbon atoms hooked to each other and um, hooked to other elements as well. So it's chains of carbon with other things potentially strung onto them. Um, what makes plastic useful is that you can make lots of different chains. You can make single chains that are flexible. You can make chains that interconnect with each other in two directions, kind of sheets. You can make three-dimensional mesh works of plastic that are harder. So um, it's a little bit like making something with Legos, right? You, could, you can make it in lots of different ways. And so if you think of carbon atoms as Legos that you can link together in different ways, that's, that's what makes plastic so abundant and so useful is because you can make it have different properties. You can make it be hard and stiff, or you can make it be flexible. You can make it be opaque if you add uh, other material, or you can make it be see-through. You, you know, so you can engineer plastic to be what you need it to be. And so that's why people use it so often. Um, manufacturers use it. Um, are there biodegradable plastics? Um, yes. And there, uh, there are a couple different answers or a couple of different ways in which you could say yes to that. One is that um, we are now discovering, or scientists are now discovering, um, that there are some bacteria that will break down plastic, uh, polyethylene, the, the plastic that's in the bottle like this, um, can be broken down by uh, some species of bacteria. It will eat almost anything else first. <laughs> and if there's nothing else left, it will break down the, the plastic. Um, but there's been some thought that this might be helpful in recycling plastics because you, you, know, you can put this bacteria in a batch of this plastic. There's nothing else there but the plastic and it breaks it down into products that could be used to make new plastics and make, make a purer kind than if you try to just melt it and recycle it the, the way we typically are doing it. So you know, that's technically biodegradable, but it's not really usefully biodegradable if there's anything else for, for bacteria to eat. Um, there are also um, other uh, compostable plastics that you can compost, but they really only break down with lots of heat. So it's got to be your backyard compost pile probably doesn't get hot enough to compost the plastics. And so um, it has to be industrially compost, which most places don't offer. And so you will find um, you know, eco-friendly and biodegradable and compostable, but um, it, it kind of is, but it's kind of not, right? I don't know whether the compostable material does break down over time more quickly than you know, just virgin plastic would. I, I, I don't know enough about, the, uh, about it to, to know whether that's the case. Um, there are other issues with the, uh, biodegradable plastics or compostable plastics. Um, there is um, polylac uh, I'm right, polylactic acid, um, PLA labeled plastic. So the, the little recycle triangle says PLA. That's the kind that you can't put hot water in or it will, your cup will shrink, <laughs> um, but you can serve cold water in it. And that um, will tend to, um, to break down more. The trouble is if you mix it with your normal recycling, then your normal recycling, when you build, you know, make something new, that normal recycling will also break down. <laughs> and so it's a, you know, it's a way of contaminating your recycling stream. If you mix 
you know, these different kinds of plastic in. So you have to be very careful about what you return. Um, so there is no, um, currently there is no perfect solution for, you know, saying yes, we can switch everything to biodegradable. It's only certain kinds of plastic are biodegradable and they are only good for certain functions. You know, so again, the PLA isn't good for hot materials. So you don't, can't make hot water pipes out of it. You can't even make coffee cups out of it. Um, so, okay, so we have a bunch of questions on Zoom. Okay. So I think we'll probably do maybe every other ask a question from Zoom classroom and sort of work it that way. Perfect. So uh, Zoom question, do you think that plastics from our local recycling ever ends up as plastic litter on the beaches? From our local recycling? Um, given what has happened with my own recycling bin, I'm sure it has. Um, I'm sure at some point uh, material has left a recycling truck, you know, you know being, been blown out of a recycling truck. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that we, we can't um, make uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to, to talk about recycling. Um, you know, I, th I think we need to note there are flaws in the system, but using a system that has flaws is probably still better than not using a system at all. Um, so I don't know if that's quite the, 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 the tenor of that question, but, um, but yeah, I, I think that I, I doubt that that intentionally happens. Um, I don't think people are just dumping recycling that they're collecting. Um, it may end up in the landfill if the economics doesn't work out to be recycling at the moment, but I doubt that as much of that is ending up on our beaches. I'd like to get back to the, um, biodegradable plastic. 50 years ago, early 1970s, I was aware that there were biodegradable plastic bags, garbage bags that were on the market. They were tested, I know in Texas, and the filler that made it biodegradable was a form of starch. And I don't know if you or someone in attendance is familiar with this, what may have happened to these these biodegradable garbage bags because they don't seem to be on the market today. And I don't know if they failed, if they were too, they, I don't know if they were too expensive to make or if they had some drawbacks. Are you aware of any of this? I, I think I have some of them under my sink in my house. So you can order them and buy them, um, have the starch. My question about them is, I mean, I, I have them. Um, my question is, are, at what level are they biodegradable? Um, one of the other pieces that I, I forgot to mention uh, with the, the first part of the answer is that they may break down, but are they breaking down into microscopic chunks of plastic that then can't break down anymore? I mean, are they breaking down the large scale structure so it no longer looks like a bag, but it's now confetti, but that confetti is still, you know, unbreakable bits of plastic. I, I just don't know. I don't know the answer to that. That's my concern with some of the, the biodegradable things that are advertised as biodegradable is that it's got to biodegrade all the way down to the, you know, the microplastic has to degrade as well. They can't just turn into confetti that, that lasts forever. And, you know, so I don't know the answer to that, but again, I, I have them in, in my sink, <laughs> under my sink. So another Zoom question, uh, how much plastic can be recycled? Is it cost efficient? And where is plastic being recycled? Um, that's a highly local question and the economics on recycling changes all the time. It's, is it cost efficient? Depends on market conditions. Um, some kinds of plastic are much easier to recycle than others. Um, the, this kind of plastic is, is, um, uh, readily recycled, it's the most accepted material. And, um, one of the good aspects of Michigan's bottle return law is that uh, it provides a steady supply of basically one kind of plastic. So you don't have to sort out or worry about contamination of other materials coming in. And so, um, so this, you know, PETE, polyethylene terephthalate, um, is, uh, it's probably the, the number one most recycled. The number two plastic that's uh, milk, uh, milk jug plastic, that also is, is readily recycled. Um, other kinds of plastic are not. PVC really can't be recycled to my knowledge. Um, so it really depends on what kind of plastic you're talking about. And one of the things that makes plastic 
very useful for manufacturing is that you can mix lots of stuff into it to help give it different properties of being harder, being shiny, being dull, being opaque, et cetera. But when you mix stuff in, that reduces its recyclability because you, you know, you've got a bunch of uh, zinc mixed in with you know, your plastic in this item and that you're trying to build something that can't have zinc in it for this item you want to recycle it into. So a lot of the recycling ends up being what they call downcycling where you take, um, you know, take grocery bags and you melt them all together and make a park bench out of it because you can't make anything else other than you know, a, you know, a solid blob of plastic and that's gonna be the, uh, the, the, the boards for your park bench. So um, you, oftentimes the recycling can't get you the same item you started with um, because it's, it's, it's you know, more contaminated, just not the, not the same properties you started with. Yes. What is styrofoam and why can't it be recycled? So styrofoam is, um, I'll, I'll, I'll back up and say I'm not a chemist, but my understanding is styrofoam is simply a kind of plastic that has, you know, extra air puffed into it. Um, so it's kind of a network of plastic that's, that's very, um, um, very porous. Um, I'm not sure entirely why it can't be recycled. Um, it's possible that if, when you heat the styrofoam to recycle it, it links together more than what the original material was linked. And there may be, a, there may be an answer right here coming. Um, the other uh, factor is it's so light that it's really expensive to haul it around because you, you, you end up taking a truck full of material that doesn't you know, it doesn't weigh very much. There's not very much ma material there in that truck. It's full, but it's full of air. Yeah, yeah, um, right. Yeah. I used to live in Mason where DART is headquartered. They're the largest probably producer of styrofoam. And, okay. um, and they did recycle, but I'm not sure what they did with it. But if okay. you lived in, in the Mason area, you could recycle your styrofoam bring it to DART and they did something with it. They could break it down and reuse it. But I think what you were saying, it's not economically practical to do on a big scale because it has to go back to the manufacturer in Mason, Michigan, which involves a lot of transportation, I guess. So. Yeah, and there was a, there was a recycling, styrofoam recycling uh, place in Holland for a while. At least they claimed they were doing recycling, but then they, they shut down. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know all the, the details of the chemistry, but it's, it's a mixture of having a market um, and you know, making it cost effective to be able to do the recycling. Um, that, one, one other thing I'll say on styrofoam is that um, if, there's, if there's anything that, to do with pla um, plastics that will help the plastic in our environment, it, that is just boycott anything made of styrofoam. Yeah, just refuse it. You know, it's styrofoam is the worst for, for um, trying to clean up out of the environment. All right, go ahead. So I might do this as a two-parter because one of the questions is uh, probably a simple one, more of methodology. Uh, all of your percentages were partial counts, not weights, correct? When we were looking at the data? Correct. We did not weigh anything, partly because we'd have to dry it and in order to really weigh things. And so this was, um, this was all... Uh, individual items, and there's a, there's issues with that because you could have a plastic bottle and one that's shattered into several pieces, and so you know the shattered one counts as more items than the the you know, whole bottle. Mm -hmm. Then getting a quick second question in: uh, Shouldn't the bottle deposit system be extended to uncarbonated beverages like iced tea, etc.? I would be all for that. Um, and you could go one further. There are um, there are systems uh, produced in Europe, which is ahead of us in many ways, that will do things like you take your cottage cheese cup and you run it through the same sort of thing as you would put a bottle in bottle return. And it reads a code and gives you, you know, credit for having recycled that cottage cheese container. So you could recycle all of your food packaging in take back machines if we would mandate to do that. One of the online questions um, asked about where plastics could be recycled. And Myers is doing a fabulous job of taking any type of plastic. So you could take 
like your bread plastics, your inner liners of your cereal boxes, um, and do and put all of that type of plastic. Um, that's my understanding anyway, yeah, into so all of those as long as it's cleaned. Yeah, so if it's clean and dry, that's mm -hmm. the those are the kind of key things. And you're talking about plastic bag recycling, correct? correct. Yeah, so yeah, correct. Um, we can't get rid of the the Pontiac Grand Am. <laughs> but it's also all the wrapping that comes on paper towels, right. um, toilet paper, all of that plastics can go in. Um, my I buy bird seed in big bags, and oftentimes that is also recyclable. If you'll see the triangle on there. Okay. So I put all sorts of plastic uh, in there. Um, and secondly, another to do, um, stop getting the plastic grocery bags, bring your own bags. Yeah. And we want, we really need to get a state wide ordinance made that outlaws plastic bag, or at least charges for plastic bag. Instead of giving you money for bringing in a, uh, another bag, it should be charging you you know, like Aldi's does, Aldi's, nobody has a problem with bringing their own bags or getting their own boxes at Aldi's. And that needs to be a statewide effort before we're going to make any dent in the plastic bag grocery our, industry. Our current state law does not allow cities to ban bags. And, and I should say that Myers was one of the key movers in getting that law put into place. Yeah. So get more. we got a uh, one more Zoom question for the time being. Uh, the book Cradle to Cradle many years ago argued for redesigning manufacturing so that ma materials can be reused for their original purpose, not downcycled. Is this still being discussed, pursued, required? It's not being required, um, at least not here. Um, my sense again is Europe is ahead of us on a lot of these things, and so it's I've, my sense is it's being discussed in Europe, maybe not required yet. But I, I think that the conversation is farther um, there than what it is here. I, I kind of did like you did I, once a year, and I did this past Sunday. I walked from uh, Evergreen Commons to St City Hall on a, a River Avenue, and I took a hefty bag and just picking up stuff. And you could almost do a sociological study what happens from block to block all the way down. The, the more commercial it is, the more trash there is. And uh, I, I found two accident sites, just like you were talking about, lots of glass, lots of small plastic all on there. And the interesting thing to my cigarette butts, I didn't pick them up. I don't have that kind of time, but there was so many of them. But at every crossroads, somebody must stop, wait for traffic, there goes the cigarette butt. At every stoplight where they have to wait longer, there was twice as many cigarette butts uh, as you went along. And areas like, um, there's a number of houses, I think between uh, 15th Street and 14th Street. Now they put their trash containers out, those ones there. So there was a certain amount of trash just from the containers being spilled out right there. And you get to certain areas like Herrick Library, and they pick up all the trash in their place. So it's really interesting to see what happens from on a 10 block area, what can be done. But I bet I picked up in about a half hour, 25 to 30 pounds. I had a hefty bag. Some of it was metal from uh, car uh, parts and stuff like that. But it's amazing what happens. I was trying to do this with the city years ago. I went to City Hall and asked him, can we we sweep the streets for for tulip time? Why can't we have a citywide trash pickup in the week before tulip time where we sweep our own streets? That's an excellent <laughs> suggestion. There's no question over okay. here. One more question. Then. I was going to say um, Hawaii has outlawed plastic bags and the way they get around it is they give you a garbage bag now. So a plastic bag under the law that's banned has handles. If they give you a garbage bag that doesn't have handles, they're not violating the law. So it really still falls on us to just say, no, we don't want plastic bags and find better alternatives. Quick little tip, those uh, liners in your cereal boxes, they make great alternatives for wax paper. I will never buy wax paper again because I save all of my little wax bags and I use them for whatever. I think we have one. <laughs> we have one more question up here.
I'm wondering with all of the excess wrapping of packages, in other words, boxes of small, large containers are wrapped two, three, four times to get into the contents that you're going to use. Is anything being done to, I know it's supposed to be making it more difficult for people who aren't supposed to get inside those things, but it certainly makes it hard for people getting in who need those things. And is that wrapping really necessary? Yeah, so I think that's a question to, um, to ask the manufacturers. The, the, yeah, um, yeah. Um, and you know, there is an economic incentive to minimize wrapping as much as they, they can. Um, well, I mean, you know, if, 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 the, if a manufacturer is paying for the wrapping and you can eliminate one layer of that somehow, then they would. But there's, you know, oftentimes there are reasons, you know, keeping it fresh or, you know, because it's mandated to have us, you know, a safety seal on it, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, to, to change, uh, to change producer behavior, you probably have to change consumer behavior. It's funny. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Dr. for his presentation. This, I think, gave us a real outlook on what's going on in Holland and what we can be doing here. And this is interesting uh, just to awaken our own, uh, shall we say, values and learn how to do these things a bit more, a bit better for the world. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, Doctor, I hope your work continues and I uh, hope it gets nationwide publication and picked up. You know, we, we've seen this on uh, 60 Minutes. We've seen this every place else. The oceans are full of crap. That's all I can say. And every, I always think about everybody going fishing, taking a styrofoam container for their bait or putting their, their fish in a styrofoam container and then tearing the styrofoam apart when they get home or they break it down by accident. So uh, maybe we should start to taking plastic or other kinds of plastic uh, that aren't so breakable. But thank you so very much for coming to HASP. And uh, I hope this is uh, help, help us understand what the environment is doing here in Holland. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me.